gentlemen. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoyed your spotlight sessions and that they were a really, really way of having an interesting and intriguing discussion. I'm hoping that some of you saw the video that was just put up now, the Freedom Is video. And I personally love that video because I think it really shows how everyone's joining together to really put an end to FGM and child early forced marriage. That video was put together by the Department for International Development. And over, uh, it was about launched, I think, last week. And it's had over 140,000 views, which is absolutely amazing. Um, in terms of timing, we're only a few minutes late, which is amazing. Um, and if we could keep up like that for the rest of the day, that would be brilliant. So we'll keep giving you updates in terms of where you need to go and for what time. So next, uh, we've got some very distinguished speakers to welcome into plenary. And I'd like to wake, welcome Zaina Badawi on stage to moderate this session. Thank you. Ladies. Sheikh Hasina and Malala. You sit here. Is everybody sitting down? Good morning, uh, Excellencies, friends, ladies, and gentlemen. I am Zain Abadawi, and I am the uh, moderator of this particular part of the uh, Girl Summit. We have three uh, fine um, members of the international community who are in the forefront of the kind of issues that you've all been discussing and will continue to discuss throughout the course of the day. So I will not abuse my position as chair by giving you any of my own thoughts because we need to hear what they have to say. They need little introduction but um, I will do that nevertheless. On my left here is Madame Chantal Compoiré. She is the First Lady. <laughs> the First Lady of Burkina Faso, and she has been very, very active both in her own country, on the continent of Africa, and um, also in international gatherings such as these to really promote the advancement of the rights of uh, girls and women wherever they may be. So she's a very passionate advocate of the kind of rights that we are all discussing. She's also a member of the Inter-African Committee on the Eradication of Harmful Traditional Practices. And um, she will tell you both about her own country and efforts to, um, to, to eradicate um, FGM, uh, FGM stroke C, and early and child marriage. Sheikh Hasina is the uh, Prime Minister of Bangladesh. <laughs> Two times Prime Minister. Uh, I think your first um, time was 96 to 2001, and now since 2009. And of course, Sheikh Hasina is also the daughter of the founding president of Bangladesh, President... <laughs> this is a hard time, she's saying. Third time, third time, third time as Prime Minister. And she's the daughter of President Rahman, who was the founding father of uh, Bangladesh. And again, um, obviously, as a woman leader in, um, in, in a Muslim country, she's doing a great deal to try to advance the, uh, the situation of her fellow countrywomen. And of course, the lovely Malala Yousafzai. <laughs> Malala. Belated happy birthday, I think you turned 17 on July the 12th this year. And Malala, Malala of course, um, tragically came to everybody's notice in October 2012 when she was shot in the head by the Taliban when she was going to school. But before that, she'd been a very powerful advocate for the right of girls to have an education. In 2008, she made a, a really groundbreaking speech, say, how dare the Taliban try to take away my education? She's been nominated twice now for the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, Malala, you're young yet, so who knows what will happen in the future. So that is our panel. Welcome to you all. <laughs> Thank you. Shake. Sheikh Hasina, 
you have um, introduced, or you have in Bangladesh, um, introduced laws such as uh, banning, uh, banning early marriage. You've raised the, uh, the age from which uh, a girl can marry, but you still have some progress to make. But give us an idea of what the situation is like in your country in terms of what you've achieved and how much further you have to get on these issues. Okay, thank you very much. This is very important issues, and especially for girls. And I'm very happy to be at the Girls' Summit 2014 at the invitation of Prime Minister Cameroon and Mr. Tony Lake. Child marriage is like a paradox in Bangladesh, it's globally praised development story that enjoys some of the best indicators of political, economic, and social empowerment of women in South Asia and beyond. Child marriage certainly deserves our focused attention, but it can't be treated in isolation. In Bangladesh, therefore, we are addressing the issues in a holistic manner which help us achieve a sustained decline the last two decades. First of all, I believe a bold and secular political commitment has been extremely important in tackling a socially sensitive challenge like child marriage. I have been leading this from the front against significant opposition from religion-based political parties such as Jamaiti Islami and other groups that also opposed our national women development policy 2011 and threatened to scrap it. So from 1996 to 2001, when we were in power, we adopted this policy. But 2001, when BNP and Jamaat Islami came to power together, so they scrapped many you know, issues of this um, women policy. But in 2008, when we won the election, then again, we adopted this policy. Second is a strong legislation. We have in place a Child Marriage Restraint Act dating back to 1929. We are currently updated the law to provide harsher penalties and prosecution. My government has also enacted the country's first Children's Act 2011 and the National Children Policy 2012 supported by our Compulsory Birth Registration Act, provide a comprehensive legal redress against child marriage. In the past, we hadn't had any birth registration, so now it is compulsory. In addition to updating laws, we aim to have a national action plan on prevention of child marriage with time-bound targets. And yet, have and yet having stringent laws and policies alone is not enough to prevent child marriage. In poorer societies, if it is not supported by investment in education and economic empowerment of adults and girls. So I firmly believe that our policy of providing completely free education to girls up to the 12th grade, supported by our secondary school female student stipend programs, cash incentives to parents and free text books to, the, to all the students have all been principal drivers in retaining adults and girls in schools and delaying their marriage. Because in our society what happened, the poor or middle class family, especially the poor parents, they want to spend money for boys, but not for girls. When we started distributing free books and stipend to the girls, that encouraged them to send their children to the school. Now in the primary level, our enrollment is almost 100%, and secondary, secondary level, it is improving. 
it is also nearly uh, the same. I have plans to take free educational stipend for adolescent girls up to graduation level. I am, I am currently administering 133,000 girls from the Prime Minister's special fund. I form a trust fund for education. From that fund, now we have started providing stipend to the girls. Of course, we will give to the boys also, but gradually we will increase this up to masters so that, masters, so that our girls can get education. So parents don't need to spend any money. That responsibility we have taken ourselves. Finally, we have introduced employment opportunities for high school girls, graduates, whereby 60% of our primary school teachers are now young girls, giving them a livelihood choice other than marriage. Because for primary teacher, 60% should be women. That we have introduced. That gives them a job, job opportunity. Moreover, our community-based social interventions, including information helplines for adolescent girls, community-based child protection committees, and adolescent or Kishori clubs. Kishori means adolescent. In Bangla, we call Kishori. So Kishori clubs, where 20 girls and 10 boys work voluntarily along with parents, faith-based, and community leaders to create peer group support for preventing child marriage. So any time, any family, if they try to marry the teenage, this group immediately they inform the authority so that we can prevent it. So preventive measures we have taken. We must also break the patriarchal mindset in our men and boys so that they are convinced to say no to child marriage as a social place. To this effect, we have launched our national forum on social norm change involving the civil society politician and media to transform society's attitude towards child marriage. Lastly, I want to flag a practical problem that the reproductive health cycle in adolescent girls in tropical countries such as Bangladesh is triggered much earlier than that in colder countries. Hence, we need to further expand social and physical protection to our young girls so that poor parents stop considering marriage as the easiest means for ensuring safety, security of girl child, which is very, very important. In Western societies, including the UK, we witnessed a rise in teen pregnancy and single young mother family, highest in you know, US, second in UK, uh, when responsibility of the newborn lay with the mother or the state. In poorer societies, under 18 marriage seemed to be a safer alternate to that so that the girl is better protected within the union of marriage before bearing a child. In general, I can see that social acceptance about child marriage is gradually shrinking in Bangladesh. We need to build on this to make child marriage a history for our daughters and future mothers in our generation. Basically, what I feel that poverty reduction, education, and job opportunity, if we can create that, then naturally, the child marriage will reduce. Well, this is our opinion. And we have taken all these steps to ensure there's no, they should, that no. Our girls should, edu should be educated properly, and then they should go for job so that they can take their own decision. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Prime Minister.
Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed um, for giving us your blueprint there to uh, tackle these problems in your country and the importance of having the right legislation in place, but also the difficulties in tackling the societal norms that do make this kind of uh, problem persist. Um, Madame Chantal Compoiré, for two decades you've been involved in trying to eradicate uh, these harmful uh, traditions in your country and further afield in Africa. Please just give us a brief summary of uh, what you've undertaken. And uh, for those of you who are a little bit linguistically challenged when it comes to French, um, I have some headphones, I don't know about you. Madame, please, your brief comments. Il faut dire que je suis le porte-flambeau de ce noble combat qui est le combat contre les MGF, comme l'a dit notre présentatrice. Ma contribution se situe sur trois niveaux. Le niveau national, régional et international. Au plan national... En tant que présidente d'honneur du comité, inter... de comité national, j'ai soutenu les initiatives de mon pays, des acteurs de terrain, en vue d'impliquer effectivement les leaders administratifs, coutumiers, politiques et religieux, ainsi que les médias. En tant qu'ambassadrice de bonne volonté du comité interafricain, j'ai conduit de nombreuses missions de plaidoyer auprès des gouvernements, des institutions régionales et internationales, en animant, entre autres, des panels de haut niveau sur la problématique des droits des femmes et des enfants dans les, différents, euh, dans les différentes tribunes des Nations unies, de l'Union européenne et de l'Union africaine. Sur le plan international, il faut dire que j'ai incité l'engagement des autres premières dames d'Afrique afin de, de s'impliquer dans la lutte contre les MGF et les mariages précoces des enfants. Voilà, madame, ce que je peux dire par rapport à cette question. Madame merci beaucoup. Right. Thank you very much indeed for uh, setting that out for us. Um, Malala Yousafzai, you um, have been a campaigner both in your native Pakistan and uh, you've now become a powerful advocate on the international stage for uh, girls' rights and you obviously made that recent trip to Nigeria to highlight the plight of those 230-odd girls who were... Uh, um, kidnapped by uh, Boko Haram um, activists. But just first of all, address this issue, um, you know, in your own country, what, how you think the societal norms that act as a barrier to the advancement of girls, how do you think that speaking out such as you do and education campaigns can um, try to uh, stop people carrying out these traditions? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak at this great event. And I'm hopeful that through this campaign, we will see one day that every child will be going to school and girl and a woman will have equal rights as men have. Um, as you asked uh, about the conditions of um, girls' education and girls' rights in Pakistan, um, if I start from my own story, so I was this girl living in a beautiful place called Swat Valley. And it's known for its beauty and I was there going to school every day, carrying this huge bag and these heavy books, but was not realizing why is it so important to go to school. And then suddenly, in 2007, some terrorists came to that area, and they stopped girls from going to school. More than 400 schools were destroyed at that time, and women were stopped from going to markets. They were totally against girls' rights. They were totally against women's rights. And they wanted to implement their own law. They, the Taliban, the terrorists, they were against human rights. 
and they wanted to implement what they call their own Islamic law, which is totally wrong because in Islam, girls are allowed to get education. It is said that it's the, it's the duty and it's the responsibility of every person, whether, whether a boy or a girl, to get education and to get knowledge. In Islam, it is allowed. And Islam word, the word Islam means peace. And the Prophet's wife, Khadija, she was a businesswoman. So if you look at the message of Islam, it's all about women's rights and their independence. But those people, they were showing another image of Islam and they were, it was their own personal belief. It was not Islam. At that time, I could not go to school. I was one of those children, one of those girls who were deprived of education. But we spoke. We spoke for our rights. We were not realizing whether our voices would be heard or not, but we tried our best. At that time, I, uh, I wrote a diary for the BBC and as well as spoke to different media channels. And there were few people who were speaking at that time. But later on in 2009, when the military operation was done and when peace was restored in Swat, I realized that yes, our voices have the power to bring change. And we can defeat terrorism through our voice. We do not need any kind of guns or weapons. Now you asked about the whole situation of education in Pakistan and what are the reasons that girls cannot go to school. There are many other reasons as well that, that are stopping girls from going to school. The first one is poverty. If you ask a parent that why is your daughter not going to school, the parent would say, well, we are poor, I don't have money. Then if you say that what about the government school, then the government school conditions are uh, really poor, the, the, there are no teachers sometime in the school, there are no students going there, so the conditions are also very poor in the government schools where there is free education. So, and then the, some other reasons are that the parents think that education is not important for their daughters because their daughters are going to get married and they are the property of someone else. That's why why to spend money on her. So these are these cultural norms and taboos and so many other things. We all know what the issues are, but the, but the thing is that what, how can we fight these issues and how can we solve these problems? And the first message I would give to all parents and everyone here is that we should not be followers of those traditions which go against women's rights. We are the human beings and we made the traditions. We are the human beings and we make the traditions. So we should have the right to change it. Traditions are not sent from heaven. They are not sent from God. This is, this is we who make cultures. And we have the right to change it and we should change it. Those traditions and norms that go against the rights of girls, they should be stopped. Woman, a girl is a human being and she should be respected. That's why we ask that the FGM should be stopped. We ask that there should be no early child forced marriages. And a girl has the right to be treated as a boy. If you think of a boy, the boy has the right to live his life the way he wants. So the same a girl should have. And a girl has the right not to get married uh, early because she needs education. And when we think about solution, I think the best solution is education. Let's educate the girl. Let's educate the girl and let's provide her, let's make her this, uh, let's make her independent because when a girl gets education, she becomes independent. She realizes that yes, she is also a person, she is a human being and she has equal rights as men have. And then she realizes that yes, she can contribute to her society as well. She's not only a wife, she's not only a daughter, but she is a woman as well. So education is the best way through which we can fight all the problems that we are discussing now. Thank you. Picking up this situation of, of, of education and the importance of it that Malala has raised, um, Madame Compoiré, I want to ask you this question, which is, sadly, sometimes we see at grassroots level and in communities in Africa and elsewhere, that very often it's the women themselves who perpetuate some harmful practices like FGM stroke um, cutting. And so how important is it to educate women themselves about their sexual and reproductive health rights and also to learn how to redefine their own sexuality in a way so that they don't persist with this harmful practice. And I know progress has been made, particularly for instance in Senegal, where the FGMC is really being uh, rolled back, the campaign there has really shown results and there, there isn't so much and that's just completely through a community grassroots um, education campaign. So the importance of uh, making sure that the women themselves don't 
perpetuate these harmful practices. Briefly, if you would. Il s'agira, je pense, d'entreprendre des programmes éducatifs dans nos pays. Par exemple, au Burkina Faso, nous avons introduit dans les curricula des enseignants le module MGF que nous allons mettre en application à la rentrée 2014-2015 dans nos écoles. Nous avons fait déjà une petite expérimentation de trois ans et dans six régions euh, du pays et où nous avons trouvé quand même euh, une satisfaction qui nous a poussé maintenant à introduire ces éléments MGF dans les curricula des enseignements. Bon, il faut dire que dans certains pays, c'est beaucoup plus facile d'éradiquer les MGF, quand ce n'est pas répandu dans tout le pays. Il faut dire qu'au Sénégal, nous avons quelques régions où la pratique de MGF sont effectives. Mais dans certains pays, par exemple, comme le Burkina Faso, le Mali, ce sont des pays où c'est sur tout le territoire national donc, c'est beaucoup plus important et il nous faut beaucoup de force pour pouvoir arriver à cette éradication. Mais au Burkina Faso, nous avons fait beaucoup d'efforts dans ce domaine-là. Nous avons réduit quand même les taux euh, avec la volonté politique, surtout l'engagement du président du Faso qui a euh, pris ses, euh, ses responsabilités d'accompagner le comité national pour lutter contre cette pratique-là. Et depuis lors, nous constatons qu'il y a une réduction effective des MGF au Burkina Faso. Parce qu'il y a la volonté politique. Tant qu'il n'y a pas de volonté politique, nous ne pouvons rien faire. Et c'est cette volonté politique, si on l'a dans certains pays africains, nous pourrons vraiment faire baisser la tolérance, amener ça à la tolérance zéro. Merci, madame. Merci. Thank you uh, for uh, your answer the setting up the importance of, of education at community levels, not just the kind of education we talk about in the classroom. Malala, and then I will come to you, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Malali, you were in Nigeria recently because, as I said, you're now campaigning for girls' rights um, all over the world. Just tell us a bit about your trip to Nigeria and when you said to people, as you said quite rightly, and I think um, uh, somebody from a Muslim background myself and somebody whose great-grandfather in Sudan, where I was born, pioneered girls' education, uh, we all know that there's nothing inimical uh, to girls' education in Islam. But how far... <coughs> Do you think that um, your message that Islam does permit women to occupy positions of power, like the lady seated to your right, <laughs> um, how far do you think that that is coming through as a universal message for all countries with large Muslim populations? Well, you asked about my Nigeria trip, so this was my 17th birthday on the 12th of July. And this year I said that I'll celebrate my birthday with my sisters who are in Nigeria who are under the abduction of Boko Haram. And I went there and I spoke for my sisters. And I went there and I met the president of um, Nigeria, but before meeting him, I met uh, the parents of those girls who are abducted. And when I met the parents, they were crying and they were, they were saying that we, we, we really want to see our girls. We don't want anything else from the president. And please send our message to the president that we want our girls to be brought back and the government should do something for it. Then I also met five other girls who escaped from the abduction of Boko Haram when they were taken to these strange areas in a truck. So those girls jumped out of the truck and when they jumped, they, their bodies got hurt and there were about like more than 50 girls who escaped. And I met those girls and they were telling me that they are still not getting education and no one is supporting them. And it was such a shame that we all speak up for them. We all say that let's do something for education and the Nigerian girls are abducted, but really we are doing nothing. 
So I was really sad when I heard that those girls don't have any protection, they don't get any health facilities. No one has even like taken them to see a doctor to take care of their health and because they got injured as well. So it was, they were in such a bad condition and their parents also need support. So that's why when I met the president, I asked him that you should make sure that the girls are released as soon as possible and the government should try its best. But the second thing is that you should definitely meet the parents and, uh, and the daughters who escaped from the abduction. Uh, so he promised me that he will do it and today is the day, uh, today the meeting will be done and I'm hopeful that it will be a successful meeting and the president will listen to the parents and listen to the girls and they will be provided full security and quality education. But other than that, I thought that <clears throat> We always wait for other people to do something. Why not I do something? And uh, so through the Malala Fund, we raised 200,000 US dollars. And through that, we are going to start projects in Nigeria for these girls. Thank you. Sheikh. Our projects would, our pro our projects would include um, providing quality education, but as well as protection and safety and health care. So the, this is what we are looking forward, and I'm hopeful that these projects will be successful. And your support is really necessary. Please support us because um, this is such a big campaign, and every one of us want every child to be going to school. So why not we work together? And um, as you asked about the image of Islam, I think there are a few people who have shown this bad image of Islam, which is not true, as I already said. Islam is a religion of peace, and Islam uh, gives like equal rights to women. So uh, I think that there are some people who need to read Quran again, who need to do a little bit more study. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Malala. And I, I think that Malala makes a very valid point that it's, it requires leadership at, at all levels, at the grassroots, as Madame Comparé was saying, at the national level. And, and I see in the audience there, Madame Irina Bokova, head of UNESCO, who uh, also at that international level is a great advocate of uh, girls' education. Um, Sheikh Hasina, you set out for us the progress that you've made introducing the law that means a girl under the age of 18 and a boy under the age of 21 in Bangladesh um, cannot uh, marry. Um, but do you have any commitments that you wish to make about how you're going to achieve even further progress? For example, you don't have a law at the moment in Bangladesh on banning forced marriage. For instance, is that something that you would, for instance, look to address? Well, uh, I just want to mention about um, what Malala said about Islam. Yes, I'm from a country, 90% are Muslims. In my country, it's a unique situation. Like in our parliament, you know, the leader of the house, leader of the opposition, deputy leader, and speaker of four are women. <laughs> but yes, you can say that it comes very easily. No, it is not true. It doesn't come easily. Even still, sometimes we have to face many problems. But it is, you know, people, the awareness we have, we could have created. So people accepted us, and that is important. That is important. That how we work. Well, you know, current UNICEF evidence claims that Bangladesh's robust women empowerment social interventions have accelerated reduction in child marriage prevalence, especially over the last decades. In the last 20 years, uh, our under 15 vulnerable group child marriage have slashed down from 52% to 17%, while proportion of under 18 child marriage also witnessed a decline from 37% uh, to 29%. Well, this sustained declines encourage me to be bold and ambitious in setting our future targets for progressively eliminate child marriage from Bangladesh. Also, when it comes to the future, I love to challenge our people with bold and ambitious targets. We have a vision 2021, whereby we aim 
to transform Bangladesh into a middle income knowledge driven modern economy by the time we celebrate our 50th anniversary, anniversary of our independence. If we want to develop a society, but we cannot develop the half, we need to develop whole society. That means men, women, all together. So in the vision 2021, it is our aim. We want to reduce the marriage, I mean, I mean uh, between 15 and 18. So uh, I feel that within 2021, we'll, there will be no marriage taking place in Bangladesh below the age of 15 that I can ensure you. That's so that's the and that <laughs> number of girls marries, you know, below 18, yeah. that is, we have targeted with uh, 2041. Okay, so, so we have this, is, this is our target. That's and we target. are working on it. Thank and you. Uh, this is, we have to create awareness. Thank and you. And Islam, Islam always encourages women, empowerment, and women. I, I think yes. Islam is the only religion where they have given right to the women. But only few people, hand, yes. uh, I mean, hand, they try to mislead people. mislead people. They just mislead the Prime society. Minister, Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed. Prime Minister setting out a very clear date target and we all hope that uh, we can have a future free from FGM and child and forced marriage within a generation. Ladies, stay sitting. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand over now to two very important people. Um, Prime Minister David Cameron, British Prime Minister, and Anthony Lake, the Executive Director of um, UNICEF. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Ladies, stay sitting. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Hi, thank you. you. Thank you. Stay sitting. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been given all of one minute to summarize the whole mornings. Uh, and uh, let me simply very briefly recapitulate what I was telling the Prime Minister about such an impressive uh, uh, morning. Uh, first of all, I mentioned the human face that we saw uh, from Alimata and Farwa and their extraordinary story, inspiring stories. Uh, I mentioned the statistics that we presented and to re-emphasize that show that for all the progress, the encouraging progress we're making, we have to make far more progress or we are simply going to hold even or lose ground because of population growth. Uh, I mentioned the wonderful commitments that have been made during the course of the morning from governments uh, and others. Uh, and I mentioned how we will now try to, or not try to, we will, create a monitoring system so that we can have accountability and hold people to their commitments and build on them so that we can continue to make the progress in communities around the world uh, against uh, these two uh, horrible practices. Uh, I mentioned uh, something I had mentioned last night at the reception uh, of how much energy and what a sense of urgency there has been in this room uh, throughout the morning. And it began, of course, with the Youth for Change a uh, wonderful event on Saturday, not to mention the uh, drummers. Uh, I mentioned to him, and you may not uh, know this, but through social media, we are reaching hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the world, especially youth, who are committing themselves uh, to this cause. And that in turn means that we, yes, please, for all of them, let them know that. And this means that all of us in this room are a part of something much bigger. And it is a movement that we will continue to grow uh, in the coming uh, days, months, and years. Uh, and finally, I thanked him very sincerely uh, for the leadership of Her Majesty's government, for Justine Greening and DFID, and for all you have done to put together what has been a wonderful success. So Prime Minister, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tony, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm absolutely delighted that Britain is hosting this conference.
It comes in a year where I hope we're doing everything we can to demonstrate how much we care about these issues. Justine Greening, Secretary of State for uh, International Development, has put uh, women and girls and equality right at the heart of our aid program. I know you heard from Theresa May, the Home Secretary, who is introducing uh, really important legislation this year to tackle modern slavery. And uh, until recently, our, home, our Foreign Secretary, William Haig, I think did a great job at putting up front and center in our world the importance of preventing sexual violence in conflict. So this conference today should be seen in that uh, context. It's a vitally, these are vitally important issues we're addressing, and I'm really proud that Britain is determined to play her part. I want to say a few thank yous, because there are some people to thank here. I think let's start with thanking the Woolworth Academy for hosting us uh, so brilliantly. A big thank you to you. Um, I want to thank the 50 countries that are taking part, the NGOs, the faith organizations, civil society. I want to thank all of you for coming today and making this such an energetic and important conference. But I want to say a particular thank you to those people who have experience of FGM or early or childhood or forced marriage who've spoken out. It takes huge bravery to do that. And I want to thank you for doing that. I go to lots of conferences and events and seminars and think tanks and all the rest of it, and sometimes you sit there and you're not quite sure what you're trying to achieve. Here, it is absolutely clear about what we are trying to achieve. It is such a simple but noble and good ambition, and that is to outlaw the practices of female genital mutilation and childhood and early forced marriage, to outlaw them everywhere for everyone within this generation. That is the aim. That is the ambition. Now, Britain doesn't have any special magic. We wanted to host this conference because we wanted to bring people together. We're proud of our record on aid and development. We're proud that we kept our promises to the poorest people in the world and one of the few countries that have met our aim of 0.7% of our GDP. But we don't pretend any, thank you, we don't pretend any special knowledge or any special magic. We just wanted to bring people together and see what we could do to help uh, with the power of convening people to come up with ideas and commitments to outlaw these practices. That is what today is all about. But for me, the context is very simple. The context is about equality. I'm a dad with three children, two girls and a boy, and I want my girls to grow up with every opportunity that my son has, with no disadvantage, with the chance to make everything that my girls can of their lives. And that is really what this is. It's about equality. And there, of course, there are so many things when it comes to tackling inequality we need to address, whether it is equal pay or equal rights or fighting discrimination or equal opportunities, including in political life. But what seems to me is so important about these two issues is they are absolutely standing rebukes to our world that they still exist. And so when we think of the fight for equality, which should be at the heart of the replacements to the Millennium Development Goals, it's absolutely clear to me that we've got to start with outlawing these practices, which is why today's conference is so important. Now, when the, we make commitments like this, I think we have to ask ourselves three very straightforward questions. Why give these issues such a priority? How are we going to achieve our goals? And crucially, will what we are about to do, will it work? And how are we going to follow up on the promises that we make. Now the why, I think, is simple. These practices are just simply a violation of girls' rights. They are a total violation of the chance to enjoy your childhood and the chance to lead a fulfilling life. That is why these issues matter so much. And the figures are so shocking. Here in the United Kingdom, 130,000 people affected by FGM, 60,000 girls under the age of 15 potentially at risk. And then when we consider the global figures, 130 million women in our world affected by FGM and 63 million more potentially at risk by 2050. And when we look at the problems of childhood and early forced marriage, in our world today, 700 million people married as children, 
and a further 280 million at risk. When we think of the great development challenges that we face, of eradicating poverty, of dealing with diseases, uh, malaria, TB, polio, this ranks alongside that in terms of the scale of the challenge that we face and the scale of the ambition uh, that we need in order to, to defeat it. But above all, in answering the question, why these two issues, I would argue that we are dealing with a preventable evil. This does not have to happen. And with the right combination of effort, political will, and hard work, we can achieve what we have set out to achieve. So how do we do it? Well, I think this charter that countries have signed today and organizations are signing today is so simple and clear, written in plain language, very clear commitments that people and countries are making. And I think what is so good about it is that it understands the fundamental point that simply passing a law or simply spending some money is not enough. Politicians are very good at passing laws. We're also quite good at spending money. <laughs> but what politicians aren't always good at is following through and making sure that a change in law leads to a change in culture, leads to a change in practice. And that is why I think this charter, with all the commitments it makes for what countries and families and people must do, is so good. And here in Britain, we want to be good to our word. It is already illegal to marry as a child. It is already illegal to push someone into a forced marriage. It's already illegal uh, to take part in female genital mutilation. But that's not enough. And so I can tell you today about the pledges that we are making, that we are saying it is now a mandatory duty on doctors and teachers and others to report when these things happen so that we can put a stop to it. And for the first time, we're going to legislate so that parents are liable if they allow their daughters to be cut. Of course, added to this are the funds that we'll provide, both here, domestically in the UK, and £25 million to international uh, help in terms of childhood and forced marriage, and £35 million commitment to help fight uh, FGM internationally. I believe if we adopt this charter, if we use it as a campaigning vehicle to start a campaign now and all over the world, we can achieve the goals that we have. So to that final question, will it work? Well, we've already got 230 signatures. We've already got 21 governments that have made that commitment. But as Tony said, what this has got to be about is building a global movement. A global movement that doesn't end here, a global movement that starts here, and a global movement that we can follow up monitoring what the countries have done that signed this, what the organizations have done that have signed this, to check that people keep their promises, to check that we don't just change the law, we change the culture, to check that we follow up on every single commitment that we've made. I told you about my children, so my daughter, my eldest daughter is 10, not that much younger than some of the children who get pushed into childhood or early marriage, not that much younger than girls who get cut and have their lives in so many ways taken away from them. And this really is about the world that we want children like my daughter to grow up in. Is it going to be a world where we recognize that these practices are unacceptable, but instead of just saying that, instead of just signing declarations, instead of just passing laws, we actually commit to do everything we can in our own countries and globally to outlaw these practices forever. That is the commitment that Britain makes. That is the commitment that the 21 countries have made. Now let us take this campaign, let us run it globally, and let us outlaw these practices and improve the state of our world. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Very hot in here. Um, no, thank you very much. We have um, we've got time for questions and points, but what I really want is points. I'm not the expert here, so I want to hear your stories, your thoughts, your points about how we can make sure this campaign that we're launching will really work. If you could say who you are and your organization, and there's, I think, roving microphones, but uh, you may not need that. Lady here.
Good afternoon, my name is Deborah Owen and I'm from an organization called Made Equal. And um, our organization is about engaging with people in their 20s and 30s around issues of gender inequality. And so my question to you, Mr. Prime Minister, and thank you for being here, is what do you see as the role of young individuals and young professionals who are not under 25, but are, who are not also over 40 or over 50, who are um, professionals and who are eager to be involved in campaigns? And how do you hope that they will be part of the change that you want to see? Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, I think the first thing is spreading the word. I I think that uh, what seems to have happened on social media this morning with this conference and what happened over the weekend is already taking the message from this conference and spreading it far wider. But I think there's a role for everybody in making some of these arguments about what needs to be done. Because th this point about just passing a law or spending money is so true because in the end what we need to happen is for cultural change to take place, for parents, for communities to see this is no longer acceptable. And breaking down those taboos is very hard uh, because practices have become very ingrained uh, with certain people in certain countries. And so that's where the real campaign is needed, is to change people's minds and change people's way of thinking. Um, lady here. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Raja. Raza. I'm here from Canada. I'm the president of the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow. I want you to thank you very much, Prime Minister. We look upon you as an example of change. And... It's very, very inspiring. I hope that Canada and America will follow suit for sure in these issues. My question to you is, how are you going about to create awareness in schools and in yeah. educational systems about these problems? Because they have to rise from the ground yes. up. And, so, and, and also, yeah. I would like to give you this DVD, which is about <laughs> these you. issues. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Now that you've received it in public, you can't not see it. Yes. Thank you. I think it's a really good question. How are we going to make this change in schools? And let's be very frank, you know, this is a problem here in Britain today. We're not here just saying, please, can we deal with this problem in other countries of the world? This is a problem here today, as the figures uh, that I gave prove. And I think in the past, I think we've been rather coy about advertising in schools and being clear in schools about what needs to change. I think we've worried sometimes about upsetting people's cultural sensitivities and sensibilities. And so things like, for instance, forced marriage, we've seen in our schools sometimes uh, people disappearing off the roll, off the school roll when they're 14 or 15, and not coming back after the summer holidays. Now, that's changed. We have a forced marriage unit uh, in the Foreign Office, which does a brilliant job of getting people back uh, from the subcontinent or elsewhere, getting back to the UK. And we also now properly uh, have uh, advertising campaigns and school information campaigns so that people, so that young people can see what their rights are. Because you read far too many stories of girls being taken on holiday to Turkey or to Pakistan or to India and not coming back. And we need to get over that by advertising properly in schools. And I think these changes we're making today about parental liability and about a duty, a mandatory duty on professionals to report means that we're saying, effectively, we're all in this together. This is not something we can just leave for a change in the law and hope that families obey it. We've all got to play our part, schools included. Uh, lady here. Thank you. Um, Jasmine de Sanguera, I'm a survivor myself of forced marriage. Prime Minister, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your leadership and making forced marriage a criminal offence. What you've done is allowed us to own this as a crime. My question is this, and it actually follows on from schools. Um, Carm Levana writes nationally to schools across the UK seeking their engagement on this. Some of the responses we receive are, this is not part of our business. Um, we don't want to offend communities. We've had examples of head teachers in British Ooh. schools tearing down posters. The, the problem is, government have issued excellent statutory guidance on tackling this issue. But what it hasn't thought about is the implementation of the guidance and the monitoring. If that were to be implemented across the statutory sector, we would have a huge culture of greater accountability. How are we going to implement and monitor the guidance which the Forced Marriage Unit have issued? Well, Jasvinder, thank you. I, um I read your book, and this was one of the things, an incredibly moving book that you wrote about your experiences, and that was one of the things that convinced me that although there were lots of people arguing, don't make 
forced marriage a criminal offence because you'll drive the practice underground, I thought, no, it is a crime and we should say it's a crime and legislate that it's a crime, which is exactly what we've done. In terms of, look, we've now uh, said that uh, schools have duties to uh, make these points. We've said very publicly that they should. Uh, I think that, I think we need to change the culture and the practice because I think up to now, as you've said, there have been too many occasions when schools have been nervous of this. I think these new mandatory duties to report, I think the new uh, parental liability, uh, the fact that uh, forced marriage is a criminal law, is now part of the criminal law, all these things will lead organisations, including schools, to change their behaviour. But where they don't, then we should, really, we should talk to them very, very, very clearly. Right, let's take some from the back. Gentleman at the back over here. Uh, yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, we are very happy to see that you are here to officially launch this uh, occasion. My question is, uh, I want to know, uh, you've made a statement here that governments are good in making policies and also good in spending the money. We are aware of the, we are aware of the fact that you're putting a lot of money, there's a lot of money from UNICEF and so on to other organizations, to, to governments. We want to know, how will you ensure that this money should trickle down, right down to the hands of the NGOs who are actually implementing this aspect of child marriage. Because right. governments are actually... <laughs> this is because when, we, when you sit in meetings, governments come to present what their countries are doing. Yep. This is exactly the work of the NGOs that they present to you. Please, we want to make sure that this money that you are giving, it should go down to the NGOs because they are actually the people implementing yep. this work on the ground. So we want to know how are you going to ensure that this should happen? Because more than uh, around 21 governments have already signed, but we know that they'll sign. Many things may not happen okay. down there. Okay, Thank you, very, good. very good point. Look, first of all, we, we have an approach in, in DFID and Justine, perhaps we'll, we'll talk more about this later, where we use our funding to get the best results that we can. Uh, we don't have any sort of uh, quasi-ideological view that it's best to do it via government-to-government -government aid or it's best to do it in this particular way. If NGOs come to us with a good plan for how you can reduce FGM or childhood and early forced marriage, we'll help to fund those NGOs because we want results. And also, I think you'll find that our aid spending in Britain is probably the most transparent anywhere in the world. We've actually set up an organization that is independent from government to report on the job that we do. We so are keen to avoid wasted money, so keen to avoid any form of corrupt money that we actually have transparency and proper reporting. And if organizations can make a good case for us for the work they do, then because we are part of this campaign to eradicate these practices, we will help to fund them. Uh, lady at the back. Oui, bonjour. It's bonjour. French. <laughs> My French is very bad, so uh, um, I will. Uh... Bon, donc, alors, je m'appelle Mervin Tumba. Je viens de la République démocratique du Congo. I think, I think, I once had a conversation with Nicolas Sarkozy running around a park in Brussels. <laughs> And um, the results weren't all good, so I'm going to put this on quickly. <laughs> okay. Bon, d'accord. Je m'appelle Mervin Tumba. Je viens de la République démocratique du Congo. En fait, le travail que moi j'ai fait dans mon pays, c'est pour plaider au nom de tous les enfants, filles comme garçons, afin que nos droits soient connus et respectés. Nous sommes ici à de cela un peu trois jours avant ces sommets. Nous avons eu à préparer les mémos. Il y a plusieurs nationalités ici. Il y a des Égyptiens, des Indiens, il y a plusieurs personnes. Le message que moi je voulais lancer, c'est tout simplement que quand nous allons rentrer dans nos pays, nous souhaiterons que vous puissiez toujours continuer à être avec nous même quand nous sommes dans nos pays, afin que ça ne se limite pas seulement ici, dans cet endroit, mais que ça aille jusqu'à la fin dans des milliers yeah. ruraux afin que le monde puisse changer. C'est ça, en fait. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. I think this is absolutely the point about how do we take the energy that's being created at this conference and make sure it continues into the future. I was talking to Tony about this earlier. I think we want to try and keep this declaration, this charter, as a live document. It doesn't end today. We encourage more countries to sign, more organizations to sign. We turn this into a global movement. But crucially, I think what Tony is talking about is perhaps establishing a panel of 
experts, technical experts, to look to see if countries are fulfilling the promises that they made. Because otherwise we'll get, as so often is the case in our world, great declaration sign, but the action underneath doesn't follow through. So that is the aim uh, with this. Let's take one more at the back. Uh, lady here with the uh, blue hair. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes the microphone. Hi, I'm Suki Singapura. I'm an ambassador for the Sharon Project and uh, the world's first burlesque performer from Singapore. And I've had to fight as an Asian woman for my art. So this is a cause that's really important to me because obviously it's fighting for freedom of choice in its base form. Um, I'd just like to ask a lot of focus has been on children in schools. But with our charity, what we often find is... Uh, for girls at university, that's their last chance where they're separated from their families for them really to be rescued from the situations. And I was just wondering, in terms of universities, which often isn't talked about, it's always sort of children, which yeah. I appreciate, what would you suggest would be the best way to deal with that? Uh, it's a very good point. We've got to make it easier for girls, whether at school or at university, to find someone independent to go to if they're worried that they're about to be subject to a forced marriage or some sort of marriage against their will. I would argue it's probably easier at university because there are uh, organizations at universities, student unions and the like, that are there to help you. Whereas when children are in school, I think in the past they've almost been more vulnerable because the schools haven't necessarily understood that these practices are going on and they've turned a blind eye. So you need to change it by making sure the schools are always switched on to this and people feel that not only can they go to their teacher, but actually the teacher has a responsibility to help them. And at universities, make sure that in every, every case there's somewhere for people to go. But at universities, people do have a greater independence, perhaps from family, so they can object if they're about to be forced into something that they don't want to do. I think I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it there. Um, I really enjoyed coming today. You've got... Um, You've got the Deputy Prime Minister coming to close the conference this afternoon. He speaks fluent French, Russian, <laughs> Dutch, and Spanish. And so you can put him to uh, the test. But this government is absolutely united across the coalition in wanting to deliver real change on these issues. So thank you for your energy. Thank you for your action. Thank you for signing this declaration. And together we'll go forward. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Go on, Jean. thank you distinguished panel for giving such a brilliant discussion and thank you um, Prime Minister for committing to dedicate to these issues. If everybody could just bear with us for one moment, we just have a few things to announce. Thank you very much. So it's now time for lunch. I can see everyone's very eager to get downstairs. But before you go, we'd just like to let you know what's going on over lunchtime. So there's a market stall, you can listen to some music, you can sign the Girls' Summit Charter that's just been talked about, and you can watch some films in our cinema room. We've also got 60 youth delegates, young people from across the world who are passionate about ending FGM and CEFN, who are in this room, and they'd all be very willing and interested to talk to the rest of you today. The next Spotlight session starts at 1.55, and we'll see you all after that. Thank you very much for this morning.